So as we move through different levels of organization and through different divisions and different regions of the nervous system, always keep in mind this basic functional unit, the neuron and its parts, the cell body, the dendrites, and the axon. So here we're going to move on to those three basic types of neurons, and I'm going to describe these functional categories based on a neuron's input and output. That is, which other cells are these neurons communicating with? So remember that the neuron is receiving signals or input on the dendrites as well as the cell body. That input might be coming from other neurons or it might be coming from receptors that detect some kind of external or internal stimuli. Those signals will flow toward the cell body from the dendrites and toward the axon hillock and if the decision is made to fire will travel down the axon towards the target cell. At the axon terminal that signal is passed on through chemical signal onto another neuron or out to the periphery to what is called an effector cell. These are also referred to as neuroeffectors or just effectors and are some kind of muscle cell or glands that will respond to that stimulation. So this flow of information from input through the cell dendrites and cell body out through the axon to the output of the target cell, these signals flow only flow in this direction, never in the opposite way. So we're going to characterize these neurons into these subtypes based on what type of input the cell gets and what type of output the cell gives. Neurons that receive information or signals on their dendrites from receptors which respond to external or internal stimuli are the sensory neurons, sometimes referred to as afferent, with an A, neurons, and sensory pathways are referred to as afferent pathways. A second type of neuron is the motor neuron, which receive information from other neurons and pass that signal directly onto peripheral effectors such as muscles or glands. From a motor neuron to effector is called the efferent pathway, that is efferent with an E. The last category of neuron is the cell you see in between, that is receiving information from one neuron and passing it on to another neuron. That is the interneuron, and it is actually receiving information from many, many cells and integrating that information before passing it on. So I think this is the easiest way to think of these classifications, motor, sensory, and interneuron, that is the unique input and output of a neuron. Very generally speaking, these three types have characteristic locations, or more specifically, their cell bodies have characteristic locations within the nervous systems. And we'll get to that at a later point, but for now, we're going to look at the characteristic structure of these sensory, motor, and interneurons. Now, we're really only going to focus on two of these structural categorizations of neurons, the pseudo-unipolar and the multi-polar neurons, because these are the structure of the cells we're mostly talking about. And so what you want to notice here with these structures are the relation between the cell body and the cell processes, both the axons and the dendrites, or both. Now the vast majority of neurons are actually interneurons, and those, along with motor neurons, have that sort of multipolar structures, whereas sensory neurons have that pseudo-unipolar structure. And you want to note the relationship between the cell body and the dendrites on these two types of neurons right here. This reflects the fact that the cell bodies on motor and interneurons are part of the receptive region along with the dendrites of that neuron, whereas the cell bodies of sensory neurons are not involved in receiving information. These dendrites are far removed and out in the periphery of these neurons where the cell body actually lies close to the spinal cord. Remember that the various inputs of a cell is summed up at the axon hillock of neurons. So again, the location of the axon hillock reflects the fact that the cell body and sensory neurons are not involved in this integration. The axon hillock always precedes the axon, where the impulse travels down through the conducting zone towards the downstream target. Note in the sensory neuron, that axon starts from the dendrites, and the impulse would pass by the cell body before continuing on toward the axon terminals. So the nerve impulse travels down the axon and may branch off into those telodendria to the axon terminals that innervate the target. That electrical impulse causes release of chemicals or neurotransmitters at the terminal bouton through a specialized junction called the synapse, 
which we will talk about in great detail later. So at this point, the electrical signal switches over to a chemical signal. This is the secretory region or zone. I will not specifically ask you about these different regions, the receptive, conductive, and secretory regions on an exam, because I don't think the Martini text uses these terms, but I think it's a good way to understand the functions of those parts of a neuron. Also notice the different colors used for those different regions, and keep note, use this as a reference for later when we're talking about the central and peripheral nervous system divisions. The green means that the regions are in the central nervous system, and the red means they're in the peripheral nervous system. When we get to the gross anatomy, which is most of what we'll cover, you'll see, you'll never see these neurons, of course. What you see is aggregates or large groups of these neurons in the microscopic, macroscopic patterns. For instance, in the darker areas, the so-called gray matters are cell bodies and dendrites, as well as parts of the axon, whereas the so-called white matter consists completely of axons, and we'll talk about why that is white later. So keep that in mind, but for now, look at what we just learned in context of these learning objectives. But the last thing here is I want to put these neurons in context and look at a simple circuit, how these work together to perform their function. Now we're going to look at these simple reflex circuits in more detail later, but for now just look at the input-output relationships here. The sensory neuron's input in this situation is from receptors, maybe pain receptors embedded in the skin. The signal travels from those receptors through the axon, and remember, past the cell body of the sensory neuron, which, as we will see, are sitting right outside the spinal cord, but the axon is going to go into the spinal cord. That signal is relayed to an interneuron, which we'll get back to in a second, and that signal is in turn relayed to a motor neuron whose cell body is located in the spinal cord, but its axon leaves the spinal cord, goes out to the periphery to innervate the muscle, the effector, and generate movement. So let's get back to that interneuron. The diagram here is deceptively simple in regards to an interneuron's functions. An interneuron's job is to integrate many inputs from many, multiple sources and coordinate the response according to a larger context. So to end today's mini lecture, I want to go over a few important points regarding interneurons here. A very important point, although it's really more of a physiology concept that we're not going to get into much, is that most interneurons actually inhibit transmission of a signal from one neuron to another. That is, they are inhibitory. Go ask your physiology teacher about this. Around 99% of neurons are interneurons in the brain and spinal cord, and most of those are actually inhibitory. Go think about that, and I'll see you later.